April 1995, Louise Ellis, a writer and justice advocate, vanishes. Her yellow Jeep is found abandoned on the side of the road in the Gatineau Hills in Quebec. Police fear it's the last chapter in her life. Her common-law husband, Brett Morgan, is filled with dread. How are you feeling? Increasingly terror-filled. Marie Perrant, a private investigator in training, feels compelled to help find Louise. This was way above my head, but I was drawn to it. I couldn't, I couldn't let go. Following her instincts, Marie Perrant embarks on a journey into the heart of the crime. Her investigation goes so deep that police ask her help in finding the killer. I said to the detectives, I'll bring you the body back. I'll put it on a silver platter for you. We thought it was a pretty heavy claim to make for someone on her first assignment as a PI. On a sweltering July afternoon, Perrant confronts the horror of what happened to Louise. This is when I'm having sex. This is, I like to squeeze my women tight. She ventures deep into the forest with a killer, risking everything to search for the lost woman. One whiff of the police could be it for her. He's a very violent man. And he stared, and he stared, and his eyes were fixed on me. And I'm thinking in seconds, oh my God, he's realized he's made a mistake. He's gonna kill me. On a warm Saturday in April 1995, a woman sets off from her Ottawa home to spend the weekend with her ex-boyfriend and his daughter in the Gatineau Hills in nearby Quebec. She is never seen again. The woman is Louise Ellis, a 46-year-old writer and illustrator with a sense of humor and a flair for whimsy. The artichoke is sure no joke. It's related, you see, to the thistle. Tis truly an art to get to the heart without getting choke in your whistle. She started writing her first book when she was in university. She made pictures using dots from a pencil. She was writing for Chickadee, a children's magazine, and she was also working with children, making murals in schools and that sort of thing, having the children participate in the, the artwork. Louise is a woman with many friends and many passions. In about 1971, I met Louise in a dance class. I thought that she was a very beautiful person. She had kind of a piercing intelligence about her. She was someone who was quite vital, you know, with a lot of health and vitality and energy moving through her system. She's very well educated, she's artistic, she's a feminist, she's into Tai Chi and gardening. Louise's life is very full, but over the years there is one thing she has always longed for. Louise, more than anything, wanted to have a very profound and successful relationship. When she met Brett Morgan, Louise felt she'd finally found an enduring love. For just over a year, they've been living together. To me, in, in many ways, it kind of reminded me of like um, a Charlotte Bronte novel, uh, Wuthering Heights. There's this class difference. She's well-educated, and Brett was extremely blue-collar. On April 23rd, the day after Louise set out for her weekend in the Gatineau, Brett Morgan gets a phone call. He learns that Louise did not show up at her ex-boyfriend's house. Brett files a missing persons report and speaks to the media. This is Louise here. It's frightening and it's confusing. Sergeant Robert Pulfer takes on the case of Louise Ellis. Brett told us about what he'd been doing Friday evening. Apparently he and Louise went out and rented a movie called Nostradamus. Partway through the movie, he tells us that John Mazenov, who was Louise's boy from the past, called the house and 
Louise talked to him for about an hour. Louise had maintained a friendship with her ex, John Masonov, and his young daughter, who was celebrating her birthday that weekend. Saturday morning, they woke up and laid in bed and discussed the plans for the day, and she had told Brett at that point that she was going to go up to the Gatineau to visit John Masonov. She packed her bags, and uh, she left between 1 and 1.15. And that's the last he saw of her until he received a phone call Sunday afternoon. Brett calls another friend, Brenda Misson, who lives in the area. She discovers Louise's Jeep at the side of the road, not far from Masonov's cottage. No signs of anything. Um, the doors were locked, and inside were her overnight bag in the back and her um, purse in the front. With the help of Brett and others close to Louise, the police searched the area where the vehicle was found. We were all trying to look for her and involved in the search, you know, scour the bush and this and that. But there is no trace of Louise in the bushes or in the river. Brett Morgan keeps searching on his own initiative. He's making up posters with Louise's picture. He actually went up to the scene where her Suzuki sidekick was found on River Road in Wakefield and actually stood there and talked to each and every person driving a car. And he was out there all the time telling the press that I have to find my sweetie, I have to bring her home. Pulfer fears the worst. Where is Louise? We have to find Louise. Is she alive? Did she disappear? Has she been murdered? It's endless possibilities as to what happened and, and who did it. In April 1995, writer and justice advocate Louise Ellis leaves her Ottawa home for a weekend visit with her ex-boyfriend and his young daughter. Louise Ellis never arrives. Her Jeep is found an hour north of the city in the Gatineau Hills. It is locked with all of Louise's belongings in it. Her common law husband, Brett Morgan, joins the police in searching the area, but there is no trace of Louise. How are you feeling? Increasingly terror filled. As police dig deeper into Louise's disappearance, Sergeant Pulfer takes a statement from Brett and learns about the very unusual way he met Louise. We just continued talking to him and got to know a bit more about him, and he was quite free with his information. The couple met at a Supreme Court hearing into the most notorious case of wrongful imprisonment in Canadian history, the case of David Milgard. She was doing research on Milgard because she always wanted to write a book on David. Brett came forward voluntarily to identify an already convicted felon, Larry Fisher, as the man who'd committed the crime for which Milgard had unjustly been convicted. They literally met from across the room. She was very taken by the fact that he was giving testimony about such an important issue. But at the time, Brett was a convict himself. Brett was taking quite a risk, really, being a snitch, a tattletale, uh, not a popular position to be in, in in prison. And Louise found that quite admirable. Who was being led out of the courtroom in handcuffs, asked if she could talk with him a bit, and she complimented him on the fact that she thought he was courageous to do this. Louise began writing to Brett, and within a short time, they were romantically involved, and she was working to get him early parole. It grew and evolved, and it developed into a plan to get him out of jail so that he could have a productive life with her. Pulfer wants to know more about Morgan's criminal past, and Morgan is surprisingly frank. He says, I killed a hooker in Edmonton in 1978. Morgan had been convicted of manslaughter for killing a woman in an Edmonton hotel. That was 17 years before, and Morgan was high on cocaine. Louise saw him as a man who deserved a second chance. She saw him as someone who lived a hard life. I think he had been abused physically. He was into drugs, and she wanted to be that one woman who would make a difference in his life. Sergeant Pulfer also thinks Brett deserves some benefit of the doubt. Well, we had to be very open-minded because, you know, police are often criticized for having blinders on when it comes to investigations of this sort. And we had to give some credibility to Morgan because he'd reported her missing. 
In their time together, Louise had given Morgan unflagging support. She set him up in business, bought him a truck, bought him tools. His business was uh, gardening, landscaping. Brett has no apparent reason to kill Louise. I have a criminal history, but I would never do anything to harm her. In her home in the Gatineau, Marie Perrant is closely observing the unfolding drama. You know, I'm keeping an open mind here. I want to help this man. I, I'm feeling sorry for him. I'm feeling sorry for the poor woman that's disappeared. Marie, who moved to Canada from her native Scotland two years before, is just completing her training as a private eye. This case is playing out just as she's looking for a practicum. Where her Jeep had been found was only 25 minutes from where I lived. That made me a bit uncomfortable. She calls to volunteer her assistance to Louise's distraught partner, Brett Morgan. So it was arranged for the following day for me to go to his house. I had this big adrenaline rush, and I'm thinking, now, what can I do here? You know, I'm, I, I'm not experienced, really. Marie is nervous, but she is also driven by strong personal motivations. I just hated to see women being abused, and I believed being a PI, you know, I could go out and help women. And to help Louise, Marie believes she needs to start with Brett. I went up into the porch, and this man comes forward and introduces him, Brett, and he took my hand, and he said, thank you for coming, and he, he was quite charming, quite charming. Marie asks if she can tape their conversation, and Brett is entirely comfortable. My hope is the same as I'm sure everybody's, is that yeah, we find, find Louise safe and sound somewhere. Me too. I can't give up. I can't. You know, I mean, she's all I have in my life. It's, it's very hard. I'm very alone. He says, our love was profound. He says, we were like soulmates. Marie goes to the site where Louise's abandoned Jeep was found, not far from the cottage belonging to her ex-boyfriend, John Mazenov. Louise's Jeep itself was basically pulled in, situated right where this the spot is. And the Jeep was actually pulled in right into the edge, very well parked. Inside the vehicle was found a, a black canvas sack that had Louise's pajamas. It had a book of horses, which was inscribed to be given to John Mazenoff's daughter as a gift, and her wallet with all her identification, her access cards, her bank cards, everything. So I took a walk up to the cottage. I wanted to see if there was anybody there. Nobody was there. In late April, many local cottages are still closed up for the winter. Marie wonders what could have happened to Louise in this lonely countryside. Maybe a van sitting there with the bonnet up. The guy pretending he's working on his vehicle, he flags her down. Louise stops and she gets out of the car. And then quickly he grabs her. It only takes seconds. But the car's locked and all Louise's belongings are inside the car. The more I looked at the Jeep, I thought, you know, this seems more like a set, as if someone has deliberately put it there. You know, somebody's locked it and left it. I've kind of decided that it's somebody that's known Louise, but it's not a stranger. I'm pretty convinced of that. In 1995, Louise Ellis leaves her Ottawa home to visit her ex-boyfriend, John Mazenov, in the nearby Gatineau Hills in Quebec. He claims she never showed up. The following day, her Jeep is found at the side of the road in the vicinity of Masonov's cottage. Police searches find no trace of Louise, and her common law husband, Brett Morgan, is bereft. It's frightening and it's confusing. Marie Perrant, a fledgling private eye, recently arrived from Scotland, has volunteered to help Brett investigate Louise's disappearance. I felt genuinely sorry for him. He seemed so distressed. But the grieving spouse has a dark past. Morgan was convicted for manslaughter in the death of an Edmonton woman. His past makes him a suspect in Louise's disappearance. 
But police don't want to jump to conclusions. It seems that Brett has no motive for killing Louise. Pulfer wants to know more about John Masonov, the ex-boyfriend that Louise was planning to visit. Masonov and Ellis had had a bit of a, uh, an off-again, on-again relationship. And in fact, Masonov left Louise when she met Brett Morgan. Now, was Masonov jealous that Louise Ellis had been so enamored with Brett Morgan? Brett Morgan seems to think that Masonov is the most likely suspect. He confides his suspicions to private investigator Marie Perrant over a number of meetings. As far as he was concerned, John Masonov and Louise had this very abusive relationship. I'm starting to think maybe John Masonov has something to do with this. Maybe he did want Louise to leave Brett Morgan. He would have a motive. The opportunity, well, the opportunity would be there if Louise goes up to the cottage to meet him. Sergeant Pulfer pays a visit to Masonov at his workplace at the University of Ottawa. He gives the detective an alibi. The whole weekend he had spent with his daughter up at the parents' cottage. The fact remains that Louise's vehicle was found not far from that very cottage. Police stage another search, this time on Masonov's land. But there is no trace of Louise and no evidence to implicate Masonov. Pulfer considers whether there is anyone else who could have a motive for harming Louise. Brett had ratted out a violent offender when testifying on behalf of David Milgard. Larry Fisher was quite a well-known criminal, a man of violence and uh, no doubt hated Brett Morgan. He's made threats uh, towards me before. At the time of Louise's disappearance, Fisher was out of prison. He had not yet been charged for the murder that Milgard had served time for. Maybe Larry Fisher wanted to get back at Brett Morgan and maybe kidnap and kill Louise Ellis. What better way to get back at someone who basically changed your whole life and put you under the eyes of the law again? Detectives look into the whereabouts of Larry Fisher in fact, on April 22nd at about 6.10 a.m. in the morning, Larry Fisher was the subject of a road stop in Saskatchewan by an RCMP officer. So, of course, April 22nd is the day that everything happens. So at that time, Larry Fisher was eliminated as a suspect. Meanwhile, in the Gatineau, Marie is looking for new insights into the case by playing back the tape she made of her conversations with the missing woman's partner, Brett Morgan. I would just go over the recordings and analyze everything, just basically take it all back in again. Brett had inspected Louise's Jeep after it was found. And I asked him, when you looked at the, the driver's seat, I said, was it still in the same angle or was it pushed back as if somebody with longer legs might have pushed the seat back to drive? That's when she hears something that blindsides her. He says to me, it's exactly the way I left. And then you stop. This is exactly the way Louise left it when she left the house. It's exactly the same. Could this be a simple slip of the tongue? Or could it be that the man she's befriended and has volunteered to help is in fact Louise's murderer? In 1995, writer, illustrator, and justice advocate Louise Ellis leaves her Ottawa home and disappears. Her common-law husband, Brett Morgan, had been convicted of manslaughter in the death of a woman 17 years earlier. But he had won Louise's trust through his testimony in a high-profile case of wrongful imprisonment, and it seems that he is shattered by Louise's disappearance. Marie Perrant, who has volunteered to help Brett find Louise, is piqued by an incriminating slip he makes in their taped conversation about Louise's Jeep. Brett turned around and says to me, it's exactly the way I left. And then you stop. This is exactly the way Louise left it when she left the house. It's exactly the same. Marie wonders if Brett is in fact responsible for Louise's disappearance. Initially, at the very beginning, you know, I saw a man that was distressed. But as time went on, it was as if, you know, Louise was nothing anymore. As for the police, after the investigation of two other suspects goes nowhere, they're refocusing their attention on Brett. 
they've learned that Brett owed Louise over $20,000. She didn't know how she was going to deal with how it was evolving, the, the, the money situation. And it was just at that point, actually, that uh, she disappeared. Pulfer pays a visit to bank manager Lisa Costello, who says that Louise was increasingly agitated by Brett's failure to repay her. She was calling us like four or five times a day, did the money come, did the money come? But Costello says Louise and Brett's financial problems went far beyond the unpaid loan. It was mainly through her credit line that he was writing checks and putting them into his own account. He would forge her signature. She'd be raging mad, blaming the bank that we messed up. And uh, then we would find out that it was Brett Morgan that was actually doing the transactions, although she never would admit to that. Pulfer can now see a motive for Brett Morgan. I think that she was probably going to turn him into the parole officer, call the police and say, OK, here's what's been going on. Pulfer then questions Costello about any banking transactions made on the day of Louise's disappearance. He makes a startling discovery. I remember it was one of those aha moments for Bob Pulfer when he clued in. When Brett first reported Louise missing, he said she left Ottawa at 1.15. When Louise's Jeep was found, her bank card was in it. At 2.53 p.m. on April 22nd, that bank card was used to withdraw $280. Bank surveillance tape shows it was Brett who used Louise's bank card at the time Louise was supposedly out of town. We caught him in a lie and technology caught him in a lie. There was no doubt about it. Brett Morgan is now officially the prime suspect. According to forensic behavior specialist, Dr. Matt Logan, Morgan displays a number of psychopathic characteristics. The psychopath is the ultimate button presser. That's where the conning and manipulation and the word charming, which comes up with a lot of people that have been in a relationship with a psychopath, you hear the word charming. He was so charming. I would never do anything to harm her. He's extremely smooth, uh, like you would say, a real good con man. If you watch Brett Morgan on television, he seemed very uh, believable. Before Pulfer can convict this killer, he knows he needs more evidence. Pulfer confers with the prosecutor's office. Without uh, Louise Ellis's body, it would have been very difficult to, uh, to pin the murder on Mr. Morgan. We needed to find that body. Police bug Morgan's house, and a surveillance team is set up to watch the premises. Brett, my log continues not to work, so because of everything that was going on. We became aware of these conversations he was having with someone named Marie. Brett Morgan seems to like her. He seems to be telling her a lot of information. He thought that perhaps if uh, she believed him and helped him out, that yeah, he, uh, she would add credibility to his story. When the police realize that Marie is a newly minted private investigator, they decide she could be a huge asset to the case. We talked to Marie Perrin and told her we want to talk to her about the case she was on. First, they need to know what she thinks about Brett's story. I said, Marie, what do you think happened to Louise Ellis? And in her thick Scottish accent, she says, ah, I think he's killed her. Then the police make an exceptional request. You know what, Marie? Uh, Brett really trusts you. He said, you know, we can see that you've got a rapport going with him. And I said, yeah, I says, he's, actually, he's very comfortable with me. And at that point, he says, would you be willing to help us? It was very unique. We've never done it before, where a person was used to get that deeply into a murder investigation to assist the police. They said, maybe try and get information from Brett as to where Louise might be. I said, I'll tell you what. I says, I'll do better than that. I says, I'll get you the body. I felt she was driven to find the body of Louise Ellis so Louise would have some closure and some dignity to be buried properly. It's a tale of fatal attraction. Writer and illustrator Louise Ellis fell in love with convicted killer Brett Morgan after he gave testimony to help free a wrongfully convicted man. After his release, Morgan moved into Louise Ellis's comfortable home. Just shy of a year later, in 1995, Louise goes missing in the Gatineau Hills. 
and one month into the investigation, she is presumed dead. Brett Morgan becomes the prime suspect after police find evidence that he had defrauded Ellis. Their suspicions are shared by Marie Perrant, a private eye who had volunteered to help Brett find Louise, but who now believes he is her killer. When the police discover that Marie has gained Brett's trust, they make the extraordinary move of asking this civilian to work with them to help close the net on Morgan. Marie has made a big promise to Sergeant Robert Pulfer. He says, I'll do better than that. I says, I'll get you the body. We thought it was a pretty heavy claim to make for someone on her first assignment as a PI. Getting the body is crucial to the case against Brett Morgan. Worst case scenario is go ahead and, and arrest him without the, uh, the advantage of having the forensic evidence of, of the found body. To find the body, Marie and the investigators form a plan while police listen in, Marie turns the tables on Brett. She uses his attempt to cast blame on Louise's ex against him. So police want me to go along with this and play this one up. Uh, like I totally believe John Mason has uh, done away with Louise. She was the cat and Morgan was gonna be the mouse. According to Dr. Matt Logan, an expert in psychopathology, this strategy could work. The psychopath uh, can be certainly out-tricked, and these folks will play the game. They love the cat and mouse. They love getting close to people and engaging their sense of fear. I'm saying to Brett Morgan, you know, OK, you've already killed someone. You have the mind of a killer. If you were John Mason, what would you do with the body? He says, can you imagine, he says, a dead body? That's like carrying a sack of potatoes. It's a dead, dead weight. So he's very detailed. He was probably talking about himself when he talked about these different scenarios with respect to the killing of the body and the hiding of the body and that sort of thing. Marie urges Brett to go with her to the woods to search for Louise. I was putting the pressure on him, so he gave me a day. I phoned the police station and said, OK, I've got the data. The police will do everything they can to ensure her safety. Very, very risky and dangerous situation. We had to be careful to make sure we, we protected her. I went down to the station and they took my purse and he inserted a, a recorder underneath the lining of my purse. On a sweltering June day, Marie drives into the Gatineau Hills with a man who is a convicted killer. We had probably two surveillance teams to make sure that we were out there totally covering her. But on the quiet country roads, the surveillance teams can't follow too closely. She was taking a risk, she was very brazen. We told her we couldn't be with her all the time. They drove around for about an hour, an hour and a half. Finally, you can hear the motor vehicle comes to a stop and they get out of the vehicle and went for the walk through the woods. We went further into the meadow and then all of a sudden he stops and he looks at me. Brett was absolutely soaking so much so if he had wrung out his T-shirt, it would have just dripped with sweat. He turned around, he looked at me, and he stared me, and he's eyeing me up and down, and he says, you know what? He says, the only other time he says, I sweat like this is when I have sex. It's the early summer of 1995, and Marie Perrant is in the woods searching for the body of Louise Ellis, a woman who's been missing and presumed dead for just over two months. Marie is accompanied by Brett Morgan, Louise's common-law husband, who is now suspected to be her killer. In the public eye, he has played the role of the grieving spouse, and Marie had come forward to volunteer her help to him in finding Louise. But Brett Morgan doesn't know that Marie is now working with the Ottawa police. If he realizes, Marie could be in grave danger. Worst case scenario was her to getting hurt. One whiff of the police could be it for her because he was a very violent man. A surveillance team is tracking every move of Marie Perrant's perilous journey. That is, until they lose sight of Marie and Brett at what could be a crucial moment. He turned around, he looked at me, he stared me, and he's eyeing me up and down, and he says, you know what? 
This is the only other time he says, I sweat like this, he says, when I have sex. The surveillance team can hear everything, but they have no idea where in the woods Marie and Brett are. It was very unnerving. If he had decided to, to attack me or whatever, police weren't even anywhere close. I wouldn't have stood a chance against him, to be honest. He was a strong man. Everything's so quiet there. Even the birds, no noise, nothing. No wind. It was eerie, eerie quiet. Suddenly, the quiet is broken by the oppressive whir of a helicopter. And it seems so low down, and it's making this horrendous noise, and I'm going, oh, I don't believe this. And I know who it is. I know it's the police. Her safety was the primary concern we had. The cops are relieved to see Marie is safe, but the operation could be blown. And I can see him starting to freak out a bit. They asked me if I was undercover, and I said to him, you know what, I put my arms out like that. He pat me down. But he doesn't know I've got a wire in my back. And he pats me down, or he starts, and then he stops, and he says, no, I'm not going to do that. He says, I trust you, Mimi. But Brett aborts the search. For weeks after, he is skittish and refuses to go back out to look for the body. Marie and Sergeant Pulfer devise a new plan to motivate Brett, using Louise's money as bait. Bob Pulfer had called me and asked me to let Brett know the rules around um, him gaining access to her cash. Brett is the heir to Louise's estate, but Costello tells him that until her body is found, Louise can't be declared dead, and Brett can't inherit her money. He's got no money at all. He's got no money to pay the bills. He just doesn't have any access to any kind of money. He was taking office equipment, faxes, photocopiers out of her home that she owned and taking them to a, a pawn shop and pawning them off to get more money. The next component of the plan is to make Brett believe that the police are homing in on Mezanov as the prime suspect. We had Marie Perrault tell Morgan that she'd heard through the grapevine that Basically, John Mason had taken a polygraph test with respect to the missing Louise Ellis, and he'd failed the polygraph. Well, I could see him. It's like his mind went, just went into overdrive. Boom, 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 boom. I said, now, all we need is a body. If we find Louise, he says, you know, I could be blamed for this. So at that point, we're sitting down, and he's having a beer with me. He says, you could be undercover. And at that point, he's leaning over towards me, and he's getting closer to my face. And, I, you know, I just thought for a moment, God, what do I do here? Is he testing me to see if I'm really, if I, if I was a cop, I'm not going to kiss him. Within seconds, I make that judgmental call and I decide, yes, I'm going to go with this. So when he does kiss me and I do respond, oh, you know, I just made my, my blood go so cold. But I did it and it seemed to put him very much at ease. But the police who are watching are not comfortable with this at all, and with good reason, according to criminal psychologist Dr. Matt Logan. The thrill of going back to the scene of the crime is, is often sexual. It's a very, very scary game for a person to be playing with someone if that person had a total lack of remorse and lack of empathy. I get a call on my cell phone. It's the police. I say, Marie, get out of there. No. She pretends to be talking to her daughter. OK, Teresa, yeah, I'll be home shortly. OK, sweetheart, there's salad there for supper. And I says to Brett, you know what, I have to get home for Teresa. I need to get home. What are we going to do about tomorrow? It's this search on. Are we going to do this? And he says, yes, we're on for tomorrow. Marie has accomplished what she set out to do, but she gets an earful from the police. We debriefed her later on that night, and we really dumped on her. You know, what are you doing? Why are you playing that? You cannot get close to that man. It's dangerous enough without him feeling you have some feelings towards him. My main objective was to find Louise. And if it meant that I had to kiss Brett Morgan, i get him to totally believe in me, trust in me, you know, then so be it. This is the chilling story of Louise Ellis, a woman gone missing whose body, it's suspected, is hidden deep in the forest. 
Marie Perrant is a novice private investigator who has formed a relationship with Louise's common law husband, Brett Morgan, a previously convicted killer. She has offered to help him find Louise. I really wanted to find her. I really did. Marie is now convinced that it was Brett who killed his common law wife, and she has been working with the police to entrap him. Okay. Uh, I imagine that a lot of this. Brett is convinced that finding the body will lead to the arrest of Louise's ex boyfriend and allow Brett to claim Louise's money. In fact, the police are poised to charge Brett. They're depending on the recovery of the body for the evidence they need. If Marie loses Brett's trust, a killer could get away with murder. Even worse, Marie could be his next victim. On July 7th, 1995, Marie Perrant drives to the woods with Brett Morgan for the second time. I'm thinking, is this the day that I'm going to find Louise? All I wanted was Louise. That's all I wanted. Uh, of course, I'm a bit nervous. You're driving along here. There's a body out here. And you've got the man sitting beside you. He's actually killed this woman. It was really quite eerie, I'll tell you. Brett, can you imagine how you must have been feeling that day? Brett may be wary of a trap, but criminal psychologist Dr. Matt Logan comments on why he might be compelled to return to the woods. There's just a high need for, for adrenaline. Brett Morgan may have actually suspected Marie Perrant of being involved with the police or even being an operative, an undercover officer, but uh, still did what he did. And that indicates to me again um, that, that he could be interested in that stimulation. I might, I'm that close to getting caught, I might get caught. It's just so exciting to be that close to the edge. The police have wired Marie's purse for sound, and she tries to keep them abreast of her whereabouts. I would come to a street called Rue Parra, and they would, you know, I'd say to Brett, oh, look, Rue Parra. I'm banking on the police picking up exactly where I am. Marie Perrant returns to the place where she entered the woods with Louise Ellis's killer. Brett's looking at me. He says, you're not nervous, me? I said, what are you talking about? You're not nervous to be in the woods with a convicted killer? Should I be? The psychopath has a much greater tendency to, to do a very brazen uh, act of violence. I would say that she would be at huge risk if he knew she was wired. I said, do you trust me, Brett? He said, yes. I said, well, I trust you. So we continued. It seems that Brett is not so much searching as he is leading Marie. And he says to me, just be careful. There's barbed wire. I'm thinking to myself, how do you know there's barbed wire? It's a lot about power and the power of being able to go back as, as if being God and saying, I can be back here and nobody's going to get me. So we're coming in and we're going deeper and deeper. The sun's shining through the trees. Always remember. Then as they come upon a clearing, something catches Marie's eye. Brett, what's that? It looked at me. It's Louise. And then I noticed the running shoe. It felt like time had stopped. Brett stared. And his eyes were fixed on me. And I'm thinking in seconds, oh my God. He's realized he's made a mistake. He's gonna kill me. I moved forward and I grabbed him, Brett. Brett, it's all right, you're okay, don't worry. We found her, we found her, she's all right. Don't worry, it's okay. Me staring, me staring. And at that point, he blinks, and it's almost like I broke that chance fix, that, that stare that he had, and I thought, I'm okay, I'm safe. 
if she hadn't said things the way she did or hadn't done things the same way she could have been uh, his next victim. She was very brave and she was very convincing. She knew what to say to him to, to calm him down. I walked over towards Louise. What was left of her. And then he gets down on his knees and he wails, he cries. And he's shouting, Louise, Louise, Louise. The surveillance team has heard everything. They were both extremely emotional, crying and screaming and... It was somewhat of a, I found, a performance by him. Later that afternoon, Brett reports the discovery of the body. He is confident that the murder will be pinned on Masonov, but instead, Morgan is confronted by police and arrested. Once he walked in the front door of 474 Elgin Street on that day, he never saw freedom again. Detective Bofer said to me, right, Mary, is there, would you like us to pass a message for you to Brett? I said, you say to Brett Morgan from me, how does it feel to be taken down by a woman? I've never heard of a, a PI who's gone to that extent, to that danger to assist the police, to assist the family, and to assist abused women. She was determined. She was determined to see this through. Uh, she's very brave. Brett Morgan is found guilty of first-degree murder, though he maintains he's innocent. We believe she was getting ready to go out, maybe to go visit John Mazenup, and I, the, it's the Crown story. He went into the bathtub and strangled her to death in the bathtub and wrapped her body up in the shower curtain. put it in the back of the Suzuki and took her up and deposited her in a bunch of bush, covered her up. I've seen people have more respect for burying their dogs than he did for her, just covered up with a bunch of bushes. Police suspect Morgan is responsible for the unsolved murders of two additional women. But within two months of sentencing, he dies from hepatitis C. I always thought that if I were face to face with a killer, it would be a sign, a signal. And there, there was no sign. There was no signal. I say, wow, you should see the intellect of the people that they're able to charm and con. The best prison profilers don't know who's going to reoffend and who isn't. So how could 